Are you one of those loophole people? I read the Bible every day, preacher, looking for reasons for me not to serve the Lord. How many of you know there are people like that out there? I hear them all the time. People quote me these obscure verses all the time that, taken out of context, endorse or undergird their ungodly lifestyle. You know who is the master of that sort of thing? The devil. Lord God, you know all my ways. You know. so much for turning us on to us in. I trust as always that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several minutes. I'm really excited to be able to bring you tonight's teaching. It deals with the issue of praise, biblical ways to praise. What do you know about praising the Lord? Seems like we have two different camps in the church today. I'm talking about the church as a whole. There are some folks that, uh, that really are into the reverence side of things and they come into the house of God with their arms folded or their hands in their laps and, and that may be okay. And then there are those that are in the camp that like to swing from the chandelier and jump over the pews. And I say that with all due respect. I'm pretty sure there's some balance in there somewhere and we're going to be talking about some biblical ways to praise as we look into this particular uh, part of the series that we've been sharing this the series titled reminders i've been going through some reminders of our statement of purpose here at new life as we are in actually our 21st year of ministry as we've just celebrated our 20th anniversary of incarnational ministry here in this area and uh, a ministry that actually allows me to come to you by way of social media and the television television and all kind of neat opportunities. We're really excited to be a part of this and glad that you are here. But we're going to explore some of these Bible ways to praise and I trust you'd be challenged. Listen, sometimes we get it in our mind because of our upbringing and our background, our own backstory, our own history. We get it in our mind that things are a certain way and then we begin to read in the Bible and we realize that things may not be exactly the way we were taught. Quite often, what we're taught comes through the filter of other people. That's why it's really important to be reminded quite often what the Bible says and to base what you believe on what the Bible says as, to pose, as opposed to what someone else said, even myself. I am not here uh, to create little Terry followers or for someone to say, well, you know, Pastor Terry said, I trust that if anything even remotely like that is ever stated, it would sound like, well, you know, Pastor Terry showed us from the Word of God, and you can fill in the blank, the Bible says, not Pastor Terry says. Our text passage for this particular series is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 8. I want to read another uh, passage for you, which is an auxiliary passage to this particular teaching, and it's found in the book of Exodus chapter 17, verse number 11. Listen to this. As long as Moses held up his hands. The Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. That is an incredible passage. I would encourage you to go back and read the context around that. We're going to be talking about it some as we continue the teaching tonight, and I trust you'd be challenged. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for every person that's turned on the telecast tonight by whatever means they are viewing, whether it's over the television or the internet or uh, through some other uh, avenue of social media. I pray for each one, man, woman, boy, and girl, that you would speak to our hearts by your word. May we know and understand it as the word of God, and may we apply it to our lives accordingly. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, you hang on. I'm going to be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. In the meantime, keep your Bibles handy. Uh, take some notes. Follow along with us. God bless. Hands would fall down when they were going to battle. Hold up his hands, they would win. If his hands dropped, they would begin to lose. 
At some point in time, look at this, Aaron and Hur actually held up or exalted the arms of Moses during battle. Look what happened at verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 11. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. The symbolism here is pretty obvious. Pretty obvious. So long as Moses held up those hands, so long as his hands were exalted or lifted up, things went well for them. But when he dropped those hands, it didn't go very well for them. There comes a time, you'll read about this a little bit later on in the chapter, there comes a time where even though Moses was God's representative, he was a human being and he got tired. He became tired. So Aaron and Hur decided what they do. They found this big old rock and they set Moses down on the rock and they would hold his hands up. Literally, they held up or exalted or lifted up his hands. And the Israelites gained victory over their enemy as a result of that. It's a graphic example, my friends, of what it means to exalt or to lift up. When God's rep was lifted up, there was victory catch that when God's representative was lifted up there was victory it's true today when God is lifted up there's still victory when God is lifted up there's still victory let me ask you this morning do you ever lift up or exalt God do you do that your life now through your study notes study notes are a great tool and there's some questions on there some personal questions on there they give you an opportunity to to scrutinize that issue in your own life to uh, back uh, in the day the friends used to do what we called queries uh, we would look inside it's kind of a uh, convicting introspection to to ask ourselves are we living up to where we ought to be as or doing what we ought to do as followers of Christ. Those study notes can be somewhat of a help to you there, and I encourage you to ask and answer that question. Am I exalting or lifting up God? If you would say yes to that, may I ask you, how are you doing that? How are you doing that? And you may be looking back at me thinking, apostasy, how can we do that? How do you do that? How do you exalt God? How do we lift up God on a daily basis, every day, walking around life? How do we do that? Everybody say we take a look back. Everybody. Everybody say we take a look back, take a look back. to the Word. The, the answer is found in the Word. The, the instructions are in the Bible. Now let me say to you just very, very quickly exalting God, lifting up God. Beloved, that has to start in the heart. It starts in the heart. Uh, there are even passages in the Word of God that encourage us to hide the Word of God in our hearts or to guard it in our hearts. But we don't leave it there to suffocate and putrefy. Does that make sense? One of the primary means for accomplishing this necessary gesture is in the expression of worshipful, Praise. Fill in number six with me on your notes. Our worshipful praise exalts or lifts up God to his rightful position. Watch, church. At that point, that provides an open door for God, for his for God to come into our lives and for him to exercise his authority and his provision and even protection in our life. Worshipful praise. Again, it starts in the heart, but eventually must find its way to our mouth for a purposed outward proclamation. Now, I'm going to begin to land this craft, but stick with me. It's going to take just a few seconds. The very center of the Bible is found in the book of Psalm. Psalm 118. In verse 8, if you open up your Bible to the very central verse, and you do the math, it's not easy to, to, or not hard, difficult to figure this out. It is pretty easy. But Psalm 118 in verse 8 says this, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Wow. 
at the very core of the Word of God, at the very center of the Word of God, is a simple proclamation instructing us, all of us, to take refuge in the Lord. Well, Pastor Terry, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to take refuge in the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked because I have been really looking forward to telling you. Check it out. Interestingly, the longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119, 176 verses. The shortest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 117, two verses. 118, the very center, is sandwiched between the longest and the shortest. I don't know if that's significant or not, but it is very interesting to me. Very interesting. Now listen, lengthy and complex things like Psalm 119, those things may impress you. And other things, other uh, grandiose things may impress you. That is okay, but for me, simple and succinct things are very impressive to me. Primarily because I can't be brief to save my life. So brief things really impress me. I'm a student of brief things. Say amen right there. Psalm 117, that shortest chapter in the Bible, right before the central chapter. 117 and 1 says this, Praise the Lord, all you nations, and stole Him, all you peoples, for great is the love toward us, or His love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. And when I read that, the first thing that popped into my mind, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but the first thing that popped into my mind was, Any questions? Any questions? Praise the Lord. All you nations that stole him. What a wonderful word. All you peoples, for great is his love toward us. And and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. One of the primary means for accomplishing this necessary gesture of exalting God is in the expression of worshipful praise. Are you engaging that throughout your everyday walking around life? I'm going to do a little exercise this morning as I wind down. And it involves a reading of 13 verses of Scripture from the New Testament. I'm going to encourage you to lay all your wares aside and just listen to these 13 verses. There's a theme here. And don't trust me, I want you to try to prove me wrong. I'm going to tell you that these 13 verses represent hundreds of verses alike them. And I sorted through a ton of them to bring you these 13. But I want you to listen to this. We're talking about how do we exalt God? How do we praise God? How do we lift Him up? How do we do that? I said the answer's in the Bible. So listen to this, beginning in Psalm 30. And the first part of the verse, verse 1, it says, I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. You you get that? I'm going to lift you up, God, because you lifted me up. How many of you know that's good news? I'm not going to preach on all these, so just don't hold your breath. Psalm chapter 30, verse 4, listen to this. Sing to the Lord, you saints of His, praise His holy name. Why do we sing when we come together? Chapter 35, verse 18, I will give thanks in the great assembly. Among throngs of people, I will praise you. Oh, how many spiritual lone rangers do we have today? I don't have much time for spiritual lone rangers because of passages just like this. Psalm 47 and 1 says this, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with the cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. Later in chapter 63, I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. Chapter 70, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation always say, let God be exalted. 
Listen to chapter 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make known or make your faithfulness known through all generations. Chapter 22 or 92 of the psalm says it's good to praise the Lord. How many of you know that's true? It's good to praise the Lord. Look at this. And make music to your name, O Most High. Chapter 98 says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Burst. Boy, that sounds kind of graphic, doesn't it? What's he doing? Oh, he just bursted into jubilant song. <laughs> Chapter 98 verse 5 says, Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound. Everybody say sound. The sound of singing, not humming or thinking about it. Psalm 146, 2 says, May my prayer be set before you like incense. You, want, you know what incense is? You like that little smelly good stick. It looks like a sparkler. And the smoke begins to, ins- begins to rise up toward God. Hear him. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. And then that chapter that I love among all of them, and I guess all musicians really love this, and loud people really love this. Psalm 150 and verse number 4 says this, and I picked this out for uh, because it wasn't said in some of the other verses, but we're told here, praise him with tambourine and dancing. Oh, I can't believe he said the D word in church. (laughs) Don't he know you'll go to hell for dancing? Not this kind of dancing. Listen to me, church, please. You do not have to lift your eyes and your head to worship the Lord. You can bow your head and close your eyes if you want to. You do not have to clap your hands in order to exalt or worship God. You can put your hands in your pockets if you want to. You do not have to raise your hands in order to exalt God. You can do this number if you want to. You do not have to raise your voice in order to exalt God. You can do, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Or just think about it. You do not have to dance in order to exalt God. Thank the Lord. (laughs) My dancing looks like I just stumped my toe on something. (laughs) You don't have to dance in order to exalt God. You don't have to play a musical instrument in order to exalt God. Neither do you have to necessarily have to engage your tongue in order to exalt God. I took you there To ask you this. Why in the world would any man or woman or boy or girl that has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Why would anyone like that refuse to exalt God by any and every means biblically prescribed? I ask you. Why? Would anyone want to to do that? If you glean by careful study of God's Word that these are ways to praise, then tell me why would you look for loopholes or exceptions? Are you one of those loophole people? I read the Bible every day, preacher, looking for reasons for me not to serve the Lord. How many of you know there are people like that out there? I hear them all the time. People quote me these obscure verses all the time that, taken out of context, endorse or undergird their ungodly lifestyle. You know who is the master of that sort of thing? The devil. Can't believe he said that. Did he call me the devil? Check it out. I can't help but notice. The overwhelming majority of worshipers today, please hear what I'm saying and don't read into this. The overwhelming majority of worshipers today fail to exalt God and worship by these biblically prescribed means. I even hear some 
say things like this. Well, I don't do that. I don't do that. I, I have been told by some church folks, we don't do that here. Which prods me to ask, who, what gives any of us the right to substitute, if you please, our own methods in place of the ordained methods of God? What gives us a right to do that? And what right do we have to call ourselves disciples or, or followers of Jesus when we insist that it's okay for us to demand that Jesus yield to our preferences and our insecurities instead of trusting Him to help us follow His example? You know what I've discovered? Say what? I've discovered that as people get older, they naturally get quieter. You notice how I'm toning it down here lately? <laughs> when uh, I trust Ellen just told you a funny joke or something. There you go. Sometime, last, all the way to my mother-in-law's for Mother's Day last night, I just kept, Caleb kept looking over at me saying, Shh, you're so loud. I'm like, And I'm thinking, son, someday you will have ears like these and you'll understand. <laughs> As we get older, we naturally get quieter. How many of you know that nursing homes are quieter than birthing centers? <laughs> and daycare facilities? Let me do that again. There's a beautiful subliminal message in that. How many of you know that nursing homes are quieter than birthing centers or daycare facilities? And I said that to say this. It is perfectly okay for disciples of Christ to get older and to really cherish their quiet time. That's okay. But it's also commanded, listen to me church, it is also commanded that we exalt God through worshipful praise. It's in there. Didn't we read it this morning? Didn't you hear it? Did you hear from the Lord? And I want to encourage you disciples to reconsider these truths as we age because we need to be reminded of these things. You know, one of the things that... I get, I'm not sure what, it, what the word is. It just kind of, it kind of flabbergasts me and it interests me and it frustrates me and sometimes I'm just mesmerized by how people can come in to where the Word of God is being preached and they come in with preconceived notions. And boy, I don't know of any other topic where people are more preconceived on than worship and praise. But they come in with these preconceived notions, but then the Word of God is preached and they choose to hang on to their preconceived notions rather than what God has revealed to us in His instruction manual. Don't you just, Patrick, don't you just long for the day when some of the spiritual caterpillars metamorphosize and turn into a butterfly and a beautiful butterfly in, in terms of really understanding what it means to exalt God, to praise Him, to lift Him up, and to do that by worshipful praise. The founders of New Life Community Church understood that 20 years ago. Listen, we haven't gotten over it. Lord willing, now 19, uh, 2037, you may hear somebody saying something different than that, but for the time being, I'm going to continue to put that before you, beloved, and encourage you to lift up the name of Christ with worshipful praise by whatever means God has provided. Amen. Beloved, we're going to cut in right there. That's the end of this particular part of this series. There is more. There's a couple more parts that we've been preaching at New Life, and we'll look forward to sharing that with you 
in the coming weeks. Hey, can I ask you tonight before we sign off, and please don't cut me off yet. Don't think, well, the message is over. We don't have to listen to this part of the program. This is a pretty important part of the program because it really is just for you. Can I ask you, when is the last time you just looked heavenward, just raised your head, raised your eyes to God and give Him praise and glory? When's the last time you clapped your hands to God? You know, isn't it true that if we applaud anything more than we applaud God, then we have an idolatry problem? It's pretty easy for most of us to applaud anything nowadays. Anything can happen from our babies taking their first steps, which is great, uh, to some athlete doing something phenomenal, which is impressive. But how often do we really applaud what God has done? When's the last time you lifted up your hands? Please don't be like those who say, well, we just don't do that. Well, according to the Bible, we're supposed to do that. When's the last time you lifted your voice, really just praise the Lord right out loud, or used your tongue to magnify God? When's the last time you did that? Pastor Terry, do we have to do these things? Are you saying that I have to do these things, that I have to be as animated as you are in order to be a follower of Jesus? I'm not saying that at all. But when you consider what God has done for us in providing eternal life through Jesus and what Jesus did for us in going to the cross, shedding His blood for us, uh, being resurrected for us, and He's coming back for us, man, isn't that something worth applauding, something worth lifting our hands, something worth lifting our voice to? It's not a matter of do you have to, but who is going to stop us from doing that when we know and realize what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus? Be encouraged, beloved, to get in the Word of God and to know and understand the, the, the precedent, the template that God has established for us and be encouraged to worship Him the way He desires and deserves to be worshiped. I pray for you. Now, I know, again, there's some of you that uh, you end up, you, you may, maybe you had a godly grandfather or a godly grandmother or godly parents, and, and they filtered things to you in different ways. I'm not asking you to be disrespectful to them in any way, form, or fashion. In fact, if there are some of you listening to me and you have convictions uh, to that extent, if they're real, if they're true, and you have real godly biblical reasons for having those convictions, and I stand behind you on that. I also know that it is my job as a minister of the gospel to put before you the Word of God, the Bible, and to challenge you to lay aside your own personal preferences and those things that have been filtered to you and to follow the true and living God as uh, it's presented to us by His Word. Trust you'd be challenged to that extent. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight or whenever you might be listening to us. This may be a re-air and you're listening some other time other than uh, the evening when we uh, actually record this for that particular spot. But thanks for being with us. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church. I want to remind you, my friends, that Jesus is coming back. Is he coming back for you?